Hello, party people, and welcome to Office Hours, the online stream where I take about 15, 20 minutes and go through your top voted questions at PollGab. If you've got questions about Microsoft SQL Server, Microsoft Azure, SQL DB, anything in the Microsoft data platform, you can uh, go to that URL up at the top, pollgab.com slash room slash Brento, and I go through the top voted questions in order to uh, give you all some enlightenment. Ah, and some of them I don't actually have the answers for, especially today. You'll see why. CTI Geek, hello, welcome back. So the top voted one from my T got cold says, oh, and I got to turn on the recorder too. Let me make sure I record the questions that come in. Um, top voted question from my T got cold says, I increased my RAM from 16 gigs to 32 gigs and my buffer pool went up, but my page IO latch weights actually went up by two percentage points. What that, what might that indicate? I don't know what you mean by percentage points. It, weight stats aren't usually measured in the sense of percentages. What I because uh, remember the overall wait time might have gone down. It's just that the mix might be ever so slightly different. You don't want to measure by percentages. You want to measure by how much time is spent waiting overall. The easiest way to get that is with SP Blitz first, uh, and inside there, totally free and open source. And I show you how to get your weights stats inside of there. If you want more handheld, uh, hand holding walking through on how to monitor that information, check out my mastering server tuning class and it's the very first module in that class. Next up, DavDBA says, hey Brent, SP Blitz is recommending that I change target recovery interval from 0 to 60. I want to implement this, but I read in the documentation, yay, you read the documentation, that it can cause extra IO activity on certain systems. Have you encountered such issues? I have not, but I can also tell you that this hasn't been a setting that I've ever switched in order to get me across the finish line. It's been a setting that I've changed across a bunch of other tweaks just to get things under control, but I've never seen a situation where I've made that one switch change and I've been like, oh my gosh, there's so much extra I.O. Uh, so hopefully that helps. Uh, hey, BMC, good to see you uh, this morning. Next up, John says, a friend of mine has several hundred availability groups used for disaster recovery. They're all manual failover and async commit. They want to remove Windows failover server, Windows server failover clustering, uh, and implement read scale AGs instead. Is this risky on such a large scale? I've never used uh, uh, read scale AGs under any scale. It just hasn't been something that I've ever used. Um, and I'm specifically talking about the feature you mean here, read scale availability groups. For me, if you're going to pull out failover clustering, just because you're probably doing it for simplicity's purposes, just switch to log shipping. Log shipping is a much easier technology to manage and administer. It's been out for decades. There aren't any edge case bugs on it. Whereas when you use rarely used features like read scale AGs, you're more likely to run into problems. Good morning, Morse. Next up, Windows Millennium asks, conspiracy theory, Microsoft won't take performance in SQL Server seriously until Azure SQL DB won't have the majority of market share. Did you throw these words into a blender? Did you write this sentence in the most confusing way you possibly could? I, I, I think what you're saying is, Microsoft wants to get people to move to Azure, so they're going to ignore SQL Server. And I don't think that's as much of a conspiracy theory. I think it's it's true in a sense, but I don't think it's a conspiracy theory. I think it's just a matter of Microsoft only has so much money. They, I know it's hard to believe. You think it's like a bottomless pit of money, given what the licensing costs. But they only have so much money and so many developers, and the place where it makes more sense for them to invest new development is over on the Azure SQL DB side, because there they could make more profit if more people switch over to it. I, I would say the same thing about, uh, you know, they have all kinds of tough choices they have to make. How many people do they put on Cosmos DB? How many people do they put on their Postgres hosted solution? So at the end of the day, I think the number of staff on the SQL Server side just probably went down as they transferred more people into working on cloud projects. 
Uh, next up, SQL the Ocean says, is there a way to copy managed instance databases across a different region in Azure? I have no idea. I've had a relatively limited number of clients that have been able to go to managed instances and stay there. The clients that I've had have done proof of concepts and they've hit all kinds of stumbling blocks in managed instances. I don't say that to say it's bad. I think it's really cool. I think it's a really cool next generation for SQL Server, but I, I just haven't been able to dig deeply enough into it because of the problems that my clients hit along the way. Next up, Eduardo asks, what is your opinion of the natural language to SQL query in Azure SQL DB? Is this a game changer? For me, no. Writing the query has never really been the hard part. If you need to get data out of a database, writing the SQL hasn't been the hard part. Getting the business requirements right has always been the hard part. Somebody will just say something vague like show me profit by month across different regions. And if you just feed that into any natural language to query type thing, it's going to make a lot of assumptions and give you a query back. But that data may not actually be what you're looking for. So getting the initial wording right is very hard. And that's the job of data analysts. So if they could somehow automate that at a much higher level and say, give standardized reports across all kinds of businesses, no matter what their database schema was. Like imagine being able to just say, generate a profit and loss statement and then automatically this thing goes across all your tables and figures that out then that would be interesting but otherwise the, the vague wording is kind of a deal breaker for me Steve asks hi Brent when I'm query tuning I often find myself trying to fix a bad estimate and I'm wondering how SQL Server made that estimate is there a trace flag or a tool that shows how SQL Server came up with the estimates on plan operators I believe that there is. It's just so obscure that I never use it myself because the, the output is total garbage. Um, and I don't remember the details on it, but I can tell you what book it's in. It's in Benjamin Navarez's book, Inside the Query Optimizer. It's maybe probably 10 years old at this point, but nothing has really changed. It's still relevant today. Um, so try that. Ben Navarez, Inside the Query Optimizer. Uh, next up, Confused DBA says, my friend is using a spatial index on a table with less than 10,000 rows. He doesn't have a problem with this table. Okay. Okay, we're done here, right? No, you don't have any problems, but you're just asking questions. Okay, so... All right, he goes on, he says, oftentimes he hears that the usage of spatial indexes or data types will cause issues. Are those remarks valid? Well, why don't you ask the people that you're hearing them from? I mean, go, think about this for a second, what you just did. I'm not having any problems, but somebody told me something. Is that true? Go ask the person who's telling you those things. Why would you bother me? That's kind of bananas. SQL Baller says, have you ever seen it where a stored procedure will complete in two seconds, but if you run it with actual execution plan turned on, it takes 10 minutes to run? Um, yes, I've seen it with issues where the, the stored proc is calling a function, uh, uh, and it had to do a whole lot of like, you know, millions of executions of that function. That's one I know where I've seen it at, but I wouldn't be surprised if it happened in other places. If your goal is to get the actual execution plan, the place where I would start is I would run SP Blitz cache, and then it has a stored proc name parameter. You can call this call it with that stored proc name parameter. Now by default, SQL Server only stores the estimated plan in the plan cache, but starting with SQL Server 2019, there's a new last actual plan option, and you can turn this on, and then the actual plan or a subset of it gets stored up in the plan cache. Just be careful because that switch does have overhead. Don't turn that on and leave it on in production. Just turn it on for when you're going to be tuning for specific problems. Uh, next up, Need for Speed says, is there a way that to optimize a table that's strictly used for inserts of archival records? Got a table with 62 million rows. I noticed that my process for inserts is running slow, and I was wondering if there's anything I could check. 
The first thing I would do is get the actual execution plan for that insert. Because I tell you what, I've seen some crazy stuff. I've seen people do foreign keys. I've seen people use triggers, constraints that take a while to run. I've seen tables that have tons of indexes. Getting the actual execution plan and then looking at all the work that's involved, that's where you want to start. Sounds crazy, but there can be real work on an insert too. Chomping Bit says, my friend has a huge vendor-owned application. The vendor's config makes use of Resource Governor, which frequently kills their CheckDB runs. Mm, you're misunderstanding something there. Resource Governor doesn't kill anything. Resource Governor can slow things down, but it doesn't kill it. He says, doing so in a way that creates a false positive for disk errors. Nah, you, I think you're misunderstanding something there. Resource Governor isn't what's doing it. Something else is killing your queries, and you'll have to dig a little bit deeper in order to find out what that is. Next up, uh, I use uppercase for select says, do you have any recommendations for best practices for query store? I don't use Query Store at all, not because it's not good, but just because I have this real weird job where I'm like an emergency surgeon for databases. People come rolling into my emergency room, and I have to start working on them right away. Like, I can't say, well, go install these three things, turn these three features on, and then come back to me in a couple of few days. I have to start working on them generally the next day. So because of that, I don't have any input on that. What I would do is watch Erin Stellato's class on Pluralsight. She has a uh, query store class on Pluralsight that may cover that particular scenario. If not, go hit up the folks at dba.stackexchange.com. And then one more, the modern DBA asks, I heard you mention in a prior podcast that there's a Microsoft guide for faster data loads. Yes, it's called the Microsoft Data Warehouse Performance Loading Guide, I think. Microsoft Data Warehouse Loading Guide. Uh, what the, What is this thing called? Uh, da, 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 da. Golly, now it's funny that I can't. Data Warehouse Performance Tuning SQL Server. What is that thing called? Golly, I used to remember this all the time. It's like 20 years old. The Data Loading Performance Guide. That's what it is. The Data Loading Performance Guide. Holy smokes. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, if you search on learn.microsoft.com for the Data Loading Performance Guide, um, and if you need a name to add on to it, Stuart Ozer, no relation to me, it's O-Z-E-R. All right, so there we go. There rips through your uh, questions there. Now I'm off to go start my day. I, speaking of consulting, I have a client that I have to start uh, this morning, actually, in about 10 minutes. So I'm going to go hop into Zoom and go get ready for them. So thanks for hanging out with me today, and I will see you all on the next Office Hours. Adios.